Okay, well, obviously our topic is going to be around oxalate. We've talked about this before. I, I still just think like when I'm really trying to think about this or explain it to somebody, I feel absolutely insane about this whole thing. And so, okay, so when, I, when I'm hosting my podcast, I don't really push back on my guests too much. Like I'm not Joe Rogan. I want to hear everybody's opinions and I, I can't live other people's lives. And so I appreciate that. And we had recently somebody on who was talking about diet and cancer. And she was saying, Basically, it, it's, we need to stop demonizing certain foods, especially, you know, carnivores demonizing certain plant foods. She mentioned oxalate and, and kind of said that it was like a little bit overblown. And she, we kind of came to the agreement that like the big thing that all of us can agree on is ultra processed foods are, are absolutely terrible. And, you know, I'm like nodding along and agreeing I'm like, yeah, OK, that's fair. What would you have done in that situation? Should I have pushed back a little bit harder to say, like, well, this is a bigger problem than we think? Like, how would you have handled that? I think it's very difficult because there's not quite the level of research yet for some people to be convinced, I'd say. But what I would probably say in that situation is that anything that's highly inflammatory or, or pro-oxidative, we should be able to agree that that's something you don't want extra of in your diet. And... And I would also argue that at the same time that you don't want to demonize necessarily food groups and my family are happy omnivores. I feed them like omnivores. They don't have the degree of insulin resistance. They don't have decades of weight problems behind them. So I, I don't in any way try to influence them to be a carnivore. I just say, eat to be healthy, leave the oxalate off don't overdo the sugar, right? Like those things are kind of basics. But I think what we do is we also uh, confer sainthood on foods that don't deserve it. So I don't, I'm not trying to demonize a food per se, although there's certain things I honestly would not touch. I would not touch chia. I would not touch um like spinach, unless oh, if there's a few leaves in a salad, which I happen to be having, I am not going to worry about that. Right. But there are things I would never eat again. Rhubarb. Rhubarb is one of the highest oxalate things we eat and still call food. She is up there too. Um, and another one that's currently experiencing all kinds of great press for its benefits is chaga mushroom this one's actually in my you know it, it's in my sights because chaga mushroom in 100 grams can have an eye-watering twenty thousand milligrams of oxalate what? i mean i i kid you not the research shows it can be as high as twenty thousand milligrams that means one fifth of that food is oxalate it's not food it's not food anymore. To me, I would take that right off, right off the list of things that you would eat. So, you know, sometimes in our desire to look at the positive benefits of a food. So people will talk about how great spinach is for you. It's high in iron. It's high in calcium. We're deifying this thing and just ignoring any problems with it. Not even just oxalate phytates, there's other stuff in there, right? I mean, we do that in so many places where we we want to turn a food into like a, almost a sacrament. It's so good for us, right? And so what I'd say is neither one of these things are accurate. But the But the truth is we don't eat every food out there. Why not? They're not all good for us, right? And what if some of the things that have become part of the human food supply are not as good for us as we think? Yep. So it's not like I keep running into people who are talking about this demonization of food. Well, this just seems to be one of those places where human beings have decided to polarize. Things are extra good for us or extra bad for us. That's not the point. I'm going to say there's a third way through here, which is we don't do a cost benefit on food. We don't look at a food and go, here's its pluses, here's its minuses. And then say, okay, based on that, 
Do I want to eat it or don't I? And oxalate's not anywhere on that kind of evaluation. And it should be because it's a stressor to your system. It chelates minerals. We already know most human beings in North America are low in minerals. Why would you want a mineral chelator that's going to reduce those even further? Doesn't make any sense, right? We know that it's pro-inflammatory. There's research now which shows it turns on the inflammasome. Well, who wants inflammation to be driven in a way where it's not part of a healing process? We don't want to drive infl inflammation just for fun. Our body should be doing that only as a response to the appropriate kind of situation. Oxalate's not that, right? We're driving sterile, chronic inflammation with things that are pro-inflammatory. That's not what we want to do. And the other thing is, it's a toxin. We know it's a mitochondrial toxin. So that means your cells are not going to function as efficiently as they should. They're not going to be able to generate the amount of energy that they should. Well, that doesn't seem positive either, right? But perhaps worse than other things that turn up in our food, let's say phytates or lectins or other things like that. It's not clear to me that those suckers bioaccumulate, but oxalate bioaccumulates. And we know that from the hyperoxaluria literature, which looks at people who have genetic hyperoxaluria. Okay, you don't have to have genetic hyperoxaluria for it to be bioaccumulating. It's doing the same thing to you if it comes from your diet as if it comes from your metabolism. If you got enough of it, it bioaccumulates. And so there's research now in areas like arthritis where they're going, if you have if you have a type of arthritis where it looks like, say, rheumatoid, or it looks like psoriatic, but it doesn't operate the way you would expect it to, if you have that kind of arthritis, that perhaps you should be considering oxalate as an underpinning to that condition. And as somebody who was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis in her 20s, by the way, don't have it, was told recently, oh, you must have been misdiagnosed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, like getting your diet right matters. Like I don't, I would have to argue with somebody who thinks that oxalate doesn't matter just because you don't have kidney stones. I never had a kidney stone in my life. I, yeah. I was sick enough by 48 with my three-year-old and my eight-year-old who I was trying to, you know, be a decent mother to. Uh, that I didn't think I'd live to see them grow up. And you, oh, I'm 63. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not lying. I can get out my birth certificate. 